We're going to give it just a minute here as people get settled in front of their computers and they get comfortable. Okay. Can, can you see them? Uh, no. No. They can only see us. <laughs> we can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi, and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator of Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of introducing our event this evening, and I'm delighted to welcome our guests, Peter Cease and Simon Boughton. You can click the link that we're going to drop into the chat to get your own copy of Peter's new book, Nikki and Vera. We do have signed copies while supplies last. If you have a question for Peter or Simon, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and add one there. We do ask that questions are related to the book or topics brought up during the event. As always, thank you for your kindness and positive engagement while joining us today. If you're a kid, we'd love to hear from you. Just let us know your first name and age with your question. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also upvote the questions you like and want most answered. Now on to the event that you're waiting for. Peter Cease is an internationally acclaimed and celebrated illustrator, author, and filmmaker. One of only five children's book authors and the first picture book artist ever to have been awarded the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship, his art offers fantastical illustrations that create spellbinding worlds. Characterized by vivid details and layers, Cease's picture books show us a mythical autobiography of his life. From a love letter to his native city of Prague in the Three Golden Keys, to a mystical journey through Asia and Tibet through the Red Box, to his adopted home of New York City in Medlanka. He is also the 2012 recipient of the Hans Christian Andersen Award given to an artist whose complete works have made lasting contributions to children's literature. In conversation with Peter tonight is Simon Bowden, who has had a distinguished career in the publishing world. He started Roaring Book Press in 2000, where his publications included the Caldecott Medal winners, My Friend Rabbit, and The Man Who Walked Between the Towers. In 2018, he joined W.W. Norton and Company to create its first imprint specifically for children and young adults called Norton Young Readers that puts a focus on nonfiction books such as Free Lunch and the upcoming From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry. It's my pleasure to turn the event over to them. Heidi, thank you. And Peter, it's nice to see you here. Um, nice to see Simon. <coughs> we meet again. We're, um, <laughs> I feel we've talked, uh, we've talked across many desks over the years I've known you. Um, and here we are talking over Zoom. Um, I wanted to begin just by introducing the book. Um, for those of you who perhaps um, aren't familiar with it, um, Nikki and Vera is the story of uh, Nicholas Winton, who died. Uh, perhaps five years ago now, in 1938, as a young man, he um, was planning to take a ski vacation in Czechoslovakia uh, or in, in Europe, and instead went to Prague, which was crowded with refugees from um, the Nazi occupation of the of part of Czechoslovakia, of the borderlands earlier that year. Um, and uh, what he found there were, were several hundred thousand people in distress. Um, over the next uh, few weeks, he and friends in Prague organized the evacuation of nearly 700 children from, from Prague to London. Um, Winton found foster parents for them in, in the UK. Um, he uh, provided, or in some cases, um, created documents to allow them to travel and was able to rescue and save the lives of um, 669 kids, mostly Jewish kids, um, and get them to safety in England. When the last trainload of kids that he had helped organize the passage of was not allowed to leave Prague when the war broke out in September 1939, he put his records um, and perhaps his memories away in a box and went on to serve in the Second World War as an ambulance driver. He was evacuated from Dunkirk um, with the British Expeditionary Force. Um, I never said anything about, uh, about this remarkable act of moral courage and uh, resourcefulness until the 1980s when his wife found these records packed away in the attic and asked him about them. And what followed from that was a very famous uh, television appearance in Britain where um, Nicholas, who I think was invited onto the program under somewhat false pretenses, found himself um, 
surrounded by the now elderly um, or middle-aged or elderly children that he'd rescued. Um, and there's a famous moment, uh, which you can find on YouTube, and I recommend you do, um, where the presenter of the show asks if there's anybody in the audience who owes their life to Nicholas Winton and the audience all stand. Um, he died, as I said, in 2016, I believe, at the age of 106, which tells you that uh, people who do good live long lives sometimes. Um, and Nicky and Vera is a story, but it's also the story of nine-year-old Vera Gissing, who was one of the children Winton rescued. Um, and it weaves her story as a young child uh, being evacuated to a strange and foreign country with the story of her rescuer, Nicholas Winton, who she didn't meet until she was one of those children in the, one of those elderly children in the television audience. Um, so speaking quickly as an editor and as, as a publisher, um, it will be hard not to find this story compelling. Um, it's a story of, of, of great courage and, um, and has drama. It has this wonderful sort of moment of dramatic uh, revelation in the, in the television appearance. Um, it's also a story that uh, appealed to me as a, as a publisher, um, partic particularly because it's kind of an entry point to talking about the Holocaust for younger children, which is a rare thing. And I think this story creates that entry point because it's sort of adjacent to the Holocaust. It's not a story about um, the, that directly looks at the horror of the, um, of the Holocaust. It's a story that finds you there by telling you a story of safety in a way, but also a story of courage and a story of, res of rescue. Um, so I felt as a publisher, when Peter first told me this story, it was an opportunity. Um, one of my jobs as an editor is to, is to ask questions. And, and so I'm sitting here now and I'm finding that I'm sort of, now the book is done, I feel like my work is done and suddenly I'm confronted with asking, um, asking questions again. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the appeal of this book to me was that it, um, it struck me that Peter as, uh, as a Czech and as an emigre from Czechoslovakia would have a unique, um, a unique point of view on it. Um, I'm British, I feel invested in the story, but in fact, it wasn't familiar to me until Peter told it, told really? it, to, <laughs> told, told it to me. So um, I guess my first question to you, well, my first sort of discussion point for you, Peter, is just to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how you came to this story, you know, what, how, you know, I know how it came to me, which was across a desk in New York, talking to you, but um, I wonder how it, how it came to you for the, for the first time. So th this is good because I, I, I didn't know you would be asking me questions. I thought we both would be asked questions. So this goes with what I wanted to say as an introduction to who you are for me, because we go back long, long time. And this now seems like almost perfect project between you being from uh, where all these children went and I being from where all these children left from. So. I knew the stories through the years really in bits and pieces since I was a boy in Prague and there were lots of stories from the Second World War, but people really didn't talk about it that much. And, and I just would know that somebody grew up in England or there were people born in England, but there also were people who uh, would say I came after the war from England. So I knew stories about the trains, about the children, but since there was no Nicholas Vinton in that time, nobody knew who Put it all together how did it happen and then of course he there was this famous appearance on bbc and everybody talked about it in czechoslovakia after 88 so i i got the book and i seen the film of mate minaj who made a documentary and then i think feature film and i thought this is a great story and but it's like a story about somebody who was so good that it was impossible to think how would i do any project about somebody who was just so good and then he didn't speak about it for 50 years and then his wife goes and says, hey, what is this? So I knew about the story, but it never crossed my mind to, to, to really think about it as a project. And the problem with the stories from Prague and Czechoslovakia for a long time was that if I said, I want to do book about Prague, I want to do book about Czechoslovakia in, in New York, people said, they didn't know where it is or what it's all about. So the advantage talking to you about this project was already that you had certain understanding for what it is, which I think was always with this project that you would see it for what it is because some people really wouldn't know. And my fear was um, 
my my uh, late editor Francis Foster did a book about hero of Polish resistance, uh, uh, Father Korczak. It was a book by Tomek Bogatsky, and it was a beautiful book. But nobody knew why we talking about Warsaw, and that was my fear that I wouldn't be able to to tell the story. And then somehow with the help of Vera and 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 your your understanding, because I can understand now that I was trying to overload it with historical facts which I knew about Sudeten, about Munich Agreement, about um, Austria's annexation. And you always kept it sort of, uh, I, I can now see what you were trying to do, but I was very often trying to tell more it may be than that book could carry. So because we are on Zoom, I don't have to come to your office and thank you. So I can thank you like this for, for doing that. But um, so that was the story that I think you had a really good understanding of the whole thing. I think it is. It, it is the. It was Vera that made the magic in in the book. In a way, is what turned it into from a a book about a historical figure who did a wonderful thing, and a brave thing, to a book about that a child could um, find their way into. Um, so, so you know, to me, Vera's story was was the key to key to this. Um, how did you? Know, how did that piece come to you? I, I guess I have a couple of. I know that you spent some time reading Vera's diaries. And in fact, I have some images which I'll throw up on the screen in a minute. I know, I know that one of the early sort of iterations of this book was almost like an illustrated transcript of some of her words. Um, so how did you get to there? And also how did you, you know, how did you make the leap from, from just sort of reading her words to putting them on in, in your own voice, so to speak? So I, I knew with, with Nicholas Winter, it was always hard to imagine how I would draw him because he was so somehow reserved and so sort of, uh, he, the only moment when he's really, really, uh, you can see him is when he's crying in that BBC performance when he has like a little tear coming out of his eye and, but he's trying to still like be, be pretty reserved. So I, I thought, how do I draw him? I knew, we, we knew he was fencing and he went to the school where he kept, uh, Pigeons, uh, where David Neven was one of his schoolmates, and and so it was impossible to think how how to deal with his life. And then comes this book uh, by complete co coincidence. Somebody uh, suggested the the uh, the Pearls of Wisdom book of Vera Gissing, which is written by her in the moment when she doesn't know about Nic Nicholas Vinton. She only finds out about. She says in the afterword of the book, this is when I'm finding out who was Nicholas Vinton. And this book is so amazing in the way that it's this voice of a little girl who's like happy. And, and as she says, I never was facing any, any uh, person who would be mean to me till age nine. And she's running around her village and her loving parents are sort of taking her around and she's playing with the animals. And on the top of reading that book, there, there is an interview with the University of Delaware about like um, uh, Holocaust survivors. And, and she's answering these very sort of almost scientific uh, questions or like sort of scholarly questions. And she's answering, talking about the cats which are always pregnant. So she's afraid the father would be drowning the kitten. So she takes all the, all the cats to the barn and she hides them and she's called the mother of all the cats in the village. And if anybody's looking for the stray cat, they, they go to her and say, do you have our cat? And then she uh, describes how she's going to Bansevi because when they want to, to take the horse to the river to, to wash him, she goes on the just, just, just barefoot and sitting on the back of the horse to River Elba. And, and she describes how it's a fantastic feeling when she's galloping through the grass and comes to the, so she's giving this impression of, of absolutely wonderful uh, sweet childhood and she doesn't talk about any dangers which must have been known in the big city and it, to her parents because in Germany Hitler is in power since 1933 so it's like these these, these clouds which are gathering and she never talks about it she goes to school. So really the first shock for her is when all these refugees are coming from the Sudetenland and she meets a little girl who doesn't have shoes and, and, and she goes home and takes uh, shoes which are the same size and gives it to this girl who says, I, I had to run because uh, it, it, it'd be very in danger. And, and she, she brings the shoes and the mother says, you, 
you did a great, great, great job. And then she describes how the German army marches into their town and, and, and the officer comes to her uh, parents' uh, office or to her, to the room indeed in the building here. Yeah. I have, um, I'm gonna put on the screen that part of her diary, which you had made sketches for. Um, that should be visible to everybody now. Um, the, if, and you, if you can't see it, Peter, you'll have to let yeah, me so know. The, this, the, these, <laughs> these, these, were, these were the sort of illustrating her answers to the questions from the university. And, and she's describing, they are not going chronologically and she describes different, different chapters in her life. And she talks about, this is her words really, when she says the, and then the Germans march in and the commandant of the troops took over the best room in our house for his office. It was the room which had separate entrance and was used um, for special occasions, family celebrations and such. And the commandant uh, summoned our whole family before him. She has a sister, Eva, which is part of her story, but because of probably getting now older and not wanting to draw too much, I didn't make her part of the story. I remember his shiny boots stuck in my mother's rug and he said to my father, I hear you and your family speak German. Because everybody in Czechoslovakia in that time in 1939 spoke German. Um, I want everybody to speak German from now on. And the father says, I'm the head of the family. And as long as I live, we shall speak Czech. So one of the things that... Um... Sorry? One of the things that had to happen or happened in the process of making this book was that we sort of changed Vera's voice from yes, the yeah. first person to the third person, which I know was a sort of a difficult decision editorially for you, but in retrospect seems to have given the story back to Vera a little bit. Do you feel that's the no, case? No, no, I agree with you now. I didn't, because what happens when you illustrate you, it's like an animation, you listen to that voice over and over and over again to, to get into the mood of the picture. So she became my voice. I was sort of like thinking, I am Vera. So then it was hard to think she was a Vera, but that, that's how it goes. And, and this was sort of difficult too, because I was trying to come up with like sort of childlike, not childlike, but her vision of the world, which would be different from the adult vision of the world. Like she's describing the refugees uh, coming. And I've seen lots of pictures of these people from Sudetenland, which put, they put like their furniture on the carts and if they had a horse and if they had a bicycle, there was like a, a thousands of people just pouring into, into the Czech part of what was left of Czechoslovakia and coming to Prague. And they coming through her, I always kept that image of her little village, which was safe and had the safe sort of um, uh, green part in the middle of it, where she, where she sort of experiences certain things. And there are two rivers which were surrounding uh, her little uh, town. And, and then it was her barn, which was like sort of safe place where she could play with the kids. And when she notices when the mother is uh, collecting food and, and, and things in the pantry because she has a feeling and it was the same I remember my mother did the same thing that once you were not sure about the politics in Central Europe you started to sort of collect some food just in case somebody would come and start to start to bomb you or something so these were like little little things when the pictures of the colorful pictures of her childhood were supposed to be contrast to to Nicholas who was more reserved and would know what's happening. Do you want to talk a little bit about the the palette you chose for the book, the color scheme, the way you, you articulated the story through color? And I can show some pictures if you. I wish uh, I was. I, I wish I was younger and could like um, invent uh, palettes for both of them. But with Nicholas, I sort of played it safe because I use my safe dotted technique, which I used to do for uh, New York Times and editorial illustration. So it was like, uh, yeah, this was uh, cross hatch and and dots. And here I have to say, I have a mistake in this picture because Nicholas, when he comes to Prague, he, he goes to the Hotel Europa, which is on Wenceslaus Square or Navaslavské Náměstí. He gets a room, but because he decides in that moment he will be helping everybody, his room becomes an office where everybody goes to uh, get the name of their child on the list he's making. 
the Hotel Europa, it's a famous hotel, uh, still on Wenceslau Square, but I knew it as a child that it was Hotel Europa. And it used to be famous ho hotel before the Second World War. And I know somebody whose family owned a hotel. So I wanted to show off, said I drew your hotel into my new book. And he said, well, before 1950, this hotel was called Hotel Shore. So I have Hotel Europa. It had a different name in the time of Nicholas. So I'm sorry about that if some, somebody would know this. But anyway, this is the more- You can blame your editor for that. Time, a sort of, time. of research, I think. <laughs> I should redo it, but I can't, can't do that. And 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 also, I'm going on with this with this uh, story that Nicholas really goes skiing from England because he's on the vacation as a stockbroker, and he only has I think two weeks for skiing. So he always has his skis with him. Even probably at that time, his friend Martin says, "Come to Prague. There are like important things happening," and expects him to help. So for me, it was this sacrifice of. Nicholas, who has no reason to be helping people in the country he doesn't know anything about, that he gives up his skiing trip and goes into work and makes all these lists and collects photographs and 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 files all these all these papers with with the home office in England. What about the trains? You want to talk about this uh, these images of travel? Um, I know that you know travel is something that that comes up often in your work. Um, and so the trains, I think, are amazing in the way because Second World War, the, the, the terrible part of, of the Nazi occupation are the trains which are going east with people. So this, in the way, were joyful trains going west from Prague. It's amazing that these trains were allowed to go through Nazi Germany and Holland to um, Hook of Holland, and then they crossed uh, on the ferries to Harwich, and then, then they went to London to Liverpool Street Station. And for me, this was the picture because I found lots of stories, which again, I was trying to impose on, on you on uh, with, with children having different expectations from this trip. So the children who were traveling on these eight trains, some of them thought they will become famous footballers in England. Some thought they would be princesses. Some of them, like everybody had, not everybody was afraid, not everybody was uh, scared. These are little children and they had their imagination. So the train is going through this sky full of sort of uh, stars. It also goes with the last words of Vera when her mother says, every time you will see the star, think of me because we will never be apart. And, and it, this is the train going from Prague to, to London. And for me, it was also my own dream when I went to London for the first time in uh, the time of, of the Beatles when I was so uh, happy to leave the country which was behind the Iron Curtain and go to London. So it's interesting how different train rides have a different um, circumstances. And, and I think it was um, also interesting between two of us that I always wanted to do the picture from Prague on the right side and London on the left side. Just because that's how I grew up with the maps of Europe that I was always on the right side and London was on the left. And he said, no, the book is moving forward. The book is, book is moving to, to, to the right. And I, I wasn't able to somehow to do it in my head. So then you, you didn't reverse it, which I appreciate that it would be moving. Well, no, I, <laughs> of course not. Um, but that is true. I, I have this sort of fixed idea that the train should go from left to right. Yeah, no, but it's, no, but it's also a good idea that something's going out of the book because I remember I had a book, Rainbow Rhinoceros, which was, he was always, by coincidence, running forward the end of the book. And then they published it in Israel and sort of reversed. He was going always into the gutter and then somehow it felt different because he was going into the book instead of out of the book. So uh, this is... Um... This is my favorite image in the book. I, I loved how you, and this was, you know, this ended up on the cover, perhaps partly for this reason, but I loved how you carried Vera's childhood to London in this, in this, um, in this image. And I always wondered um, who that distant figure was, whether we were, you know, whether that was Vera's foster mother or whether it was, um, uh, um, you know, Nikki, perhaps. Um, but now I have the answer because I have um, I have a sketch from. Uh, uh, yeah, but nobody else. 
nobody will see the sketch. Nobody will see the sketch because I think it's a great idea. That's what I like about. If she is. Yeah, this is this, this is her mom. The lady herself. This is the mummy rainforest. It was the wonderful, wonderful English lady who came to collect her. She was she lived her with her family in Poole and outside of Liverpool, and she was like late to collect her because she she had I think in description I don't want to read the whole thing, but she she had like a flowers on her uh, on her head and she came to collect her and she was so loving she was a short lady with the bicycle and with with um, glasses so this is just the sketch i do for myself to remind myself it's not disrespect to mom <laughs> Redford. and and but i like the idea that it also could be nicholas in the distance because they say that sometimes he went to look at the children arriving but he couldn't really change any of the what they arrange with the foster families or anything so that was the question of that picture that little Vera is all alone. All the other children were collected already and she's waiting who will pick her up. The, the lady in the hat. The lady um, in the hat. You pointed out to me recently that, that we first started talking about this book around the time that um, Donald Trump was inaugurated as president. And you know, we published it just as he was making his departure. And I, I wondered, you know, I something I thought a lot about with this book is how it um, speaks about freedom and what the the sort of benefits of freedom are, I guess. And I, I wanted to read something that you and ask you about something that you'd said in an interview. Uh, this is with Forward, um, where you'd, you'd said that Americans think they're invincible. Um, you say that uh, you can feel that when people are born free, they feel invincible. It's a terrible burden to carry being born in a place that's not free, where you're lied to. I still don't know how you can make someone think independently, how you make them act like Winton did, but at least talking about him will make children think. And I, I guess I thought a lot about freedom in the context of this book and, and perhaps in the context of you know, our own politics over the last few years. And I wondered you know, what it meant to you as a larger story and how you felt it came up to today. Well, I, what is very touching that since the book came out really a few days ago, I already got lots of contacts or mails from people who I never knew, not only being in touch with some of Vinton's children, some of the people who were on these trains, but also for people who survived Auschwitz. And it's just incredible that I, all of a sudden, I, I didn't even know, because when I do the book, I don't even know that it would be used to in schools for 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 telling the story which i'm telling I, I i certainly didn't think of it it was some article in psychology today when they said how do we tell the story of holocaust to children i didn't didn't think of that but definitely in my life and in my work i i would like to keep on doing things which are dealing with freedom and how maybe easy it is to lose it when you think it 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 you you can't you are invincible and it's very hard to explain but once you live in not free society you know what i'm talking about and i think maybe it's also i was trying to figure out how did nicholas vinton become the person he did and i think his daughter answers some of these questions in the book she wrote about him but still he went to this school in stove where they were brought up to be independent thinkers to question things and I was brought up in society when everybody was supposed to think alike, when we were brainwashed. And if somebody was bad, we would all sign some petitions against the uh, Korean, South Korean people who are usurping North Korean people, whatever. And people just like, like a sheep were following and very few people would be questioning, is this, well, the ones who did, like Navalny would end up in, in, in prison, whatever. But um, so I admire like this most, I think I admired from the beginning, the story of 29 year old Englishman who comes for the first time to Prague and looks around and says, this is not working. We have to do something. And everybody says, no, no, no. We have it under control. We will do something, but first we have to like make the list. And then we have to, and Hitler is not so bad. He wouldn't dare to come here. We have lots of refugees. And he says, no, I, he actually read Mein Kampf. And he said, no, this is not going to, let's get these kids out. And he writes to President Roosevelt and to Brazil. And he wants other people to take some children. And then again, goes tribute to 
to your uh, mother country that the England is the only country which which lets children come under age 17 and they have to deposit some money because when the war or danger will be over they will go back home and I think that's a wonderful connection and 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 touching with uh, Lord um, Alfred Dubbs who is one of these children and still speaks on behalf of the children refugees. We have um, that I just wanted to remind the audience that there is uh, plenty of time and opportunity for questions. We have some questions um, already in the in the Q and A column, and I'm going to perhaps switch over to a few of those. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but those of you who who have questions, please um, please uh, dive right in. Um, so this is from let's see, uh, this is from Wendy Lucart. Um, who asks when when you first started thinking about this telling this story were there particular images that came to mind did you um and did they make it into the final book and i guess this sort of um i'll just tag on a little observation here which is that my own experience of working you know my experience of working with authors and artists is always different and my experience with you is very much that the images lay out the story before the words do um, so Wendy asks if there were particular sort of, you know, keystone images that, that you built the book from. Hello, Wendy. And uh, yes, they all, I, I think with every project, I think I have some images which make it. I, I have the very first dummy here, which we, I think the, first, the one image which I was always uh, trying to, it, it was the number for me to see eight trains. And I think I had a number of children on each train, how many children went on each train and it was always very, um, yeah, very sort of telling. And and for me, of course, it's a way of um, writing because I can't really express myself in, in rich sentences in English language. So I'm trying to create some um, narration between uh, the picture and the text. And again, I have to give it to you because I think in the first drafts, I always had the numbers uh, on the right side of the of the children on each train and and I think in the way we are telling the story if somebody wants to find out they can find out I don't think just like I do not explain the details of Kristallnacht or Munich agreement again I think it's one one a question on on, on Google you can find out everything about it and, and I'm, uh, I appreciate it and that, that image of the trains I, I was able to put up on the screen um, Here's a question from, from Elizabeth, which is more about the history. Did the children who went to London go back to the end of World War II? It's a good question. Yeah. Um, I know we know about Vera, but do you know about... I think we don't know. I don't... Um, um, I, I think it was a different story for everybody. Um, I, I, I think when the famous uh, BBC performance happened, they, con they tried to contact it 669 children, and I think they heard back from 200 and something. It's quite possible if you read Siebold's book, uh, Austerlitz, there's a little boy who lives in Wales and is Welsh, and all of a sudden he has this hazy memory that he was a child on the train, and he actually figures out that he was one of these children, and, and it's co complete amnesia because some children were three years old, some children were 15. Some children came to America. I just found out that professor at University of Wisconsin, where I was teaching, she passed last month. She was a famous uh, professor, uh, Renata Lux, and, and I probably met her when I was teaching there, but it was again, I didn't know anything about Nicholas Vinton. She might have said, I was born in Brno, just like you. I came as a child and I wouldn't know she came on the train. So it was never this discussion. The head of Israeli Air Force, Hugo Maron, was one of the children uh, who, who then ended up in Israel. Some of them went back to Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia. There is still a lady, I have an address in Prague. Who's one. So they were many different walks of life. I think they didn't talk about it that much. There's a, um, this is not a question, but there is a, a comment in the Q&A box. Um, this is from Anne who writes, and this goes to the, the previous question, she writes, my mother uh, was on the second to the last train arranged by Winton. She's 95 and mm -hmm. will be here for this presentation, but mm -hmm. for a power outage in her building. Ah, it says, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
Mm. And then she mentions the last train that he arranged that never made it out. So she, um, and, and that's been my experience as we've talked, as we published the oh, book, yeah. is that yeah. you know, there are people around the world who um, connect to this story one way or another. I know you have a lot of those stories. Um, uh, this question is from, from Edith. Uh, She's just curious about how long the gestation of this book was. Um, you know, how, how long it took you to create, how long it was in the works for. Um, and, you know, partly you've answered which came first, the writing and the, or the illustrations, but. But it's, that's part of the story. I didn't, I didn't answer your question before that we talk about it. I just remember that day when we sat in your office and that was the day when Trump was elected as a president. And we both said like, well, this will be what, what time is, is, is this going to be? And I think we both, very, like, I, I'm, even Americans born here didn't, didn't know. And it's so interesting that it um, was published just like a day, few days when, when the new administration took place. So it shows how much time it took. And it also shows how much of sometimes of the uh, desperate moments it took, but uh, all together with pandemic, which I think was part of the doing some of the sad or tragic pictures that it, it sort of for me will be always uh, connected to the time because it's like with the music, when you hear some songs, you know that you were of certain age. This whole connection to people who still, I, I, no, I shouldn't say still, I mean, all my previous books, if it was like Galileo or Darwin, were people who are not here and all of a sudden I, I feel how did I dare? There are people who remember what these trains look like or or Nicholas's daughter or daughter of Vera who, who can say, I, I was so so sort of afraid they would say, oh, what? how do you dare? This is not my, my mother's life. This is not what it looked like. So everybody was uh, so far very wonderful about it. And these stories of the people who are in their 90s, so they, they are all very gracious and wonderful people, and, and I'm, I'm deeply touched by that. Uh, Jan, yeah, I'm sorry, Jan, I think it's Kubista, who is the consul of the Czech Republic in Chicago, asks uh, what you think about the move to nominate Nicholas Winton for the Nobel Prize. Uh, I, I, I think it, it, was, it was a wonderful effort. I don't know if you can still do it now, but I know there was an effort to do it. And, and I can see now with what happened in the whole world with the reaction to people to the book, I think it's enhanced by the time of darkness or time of this, dark, this time we live in that people want to see hope, want to see somebody who, who has the courage. Uh, and I think he was, uh, he, he certainly deserved it, I, I think. Sharon has a question for both of us. Um, she wants to know what we learned about ourselves in the process of working on the book, which I'm going to have to think for a moment. Um, well, I knew from the beginning that I'm not, I mean, it's, it's like all my other books, if people dare to face incredible opposition, you know, because that's my question always from living um, in the communist country and the communist government, how come I didn't dare to go, like what people say about Second World War, how come I didn't go into underground and get, you know, machine gun, like I don't know where, but so I, I wish I would have this, this, this present. I want a warm up. I know, but it's like I didn't do it and I was sort of like uh, playing along uh, for a long time. So for me, the question is like, I admire what Nicholas Vinton did. And this is how it really started with my son talking about how do you know you have this, this courage to, to say, or oh, even like in sports, you say, no, I didn't touch it or something. I mean, it's, it's just uh, some people have it, some people don't. So I learned again that I better do books than I would be acting in the public um, office or something, because I don't know what would happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I found talking to people about the book, that's the conversation that often follows is, you know, what do you think you would have done in the right. same situation? Um, I also, you know, this is a slightly different uh, sort of way of answering the question, I guess, but um, I always think about book, what, you know, what the books I publish mean to me and which ones kind of separate themselves. Um, uh, you know, you, you publish books for a lot of different reasons um, in the course of a career. You publish them for 
you know, for entertainment or for education or for commerce or, um, and I find that there are those, you know, over the 35, 40 years I've been doing this, I've kept a quite a small shelf of the books that I think, um, in a sense, kind of throw a pebble into the water and, and, and can make a lasting difference to the um, lives and the kind of frame of reference of the children or the, the people who use them. And I, I felt that way about this book, um, that it it's the kind of publishing that um, uh, makes valuable what I do for a living. Um, this is very funny because one very famous, or very, a yeah, very well-known librarian in this country sent me, she said, who was the editor of this book? Because she doesn't have the book yet. And I said, well, Simon, and she said, he's deeply considerate, sensitive, uh, something like that. I said, should I send it to someone? I said, I can't, I can't share it. This is like a personal. So now you said it, Ellie, this is what she said about you. So you should be proud of yourself. I still can't say who it was, but that, that, that's very nice. And uh, um, yeah, that that is, that's lovely. Um, and I, I, you know, I expect this book to be, to be, um, you know, making waves in the pond for, for, for a long time. Um, we have time for one or, <clears throat> excuse me, one, maybe one more question, one or two more questions, if anybody wants to weigh in. Um, the, 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 there's one question about foreign translation and, and where else in the world the book is going to be published. I think you're probably more up to speed with that than I am. I know that the, it will be published in Czech. Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's going to be very interesting because I think it will have a different, different, um, slightly different take in, in, in every country. I think America is great in the way that it's, it didn't happen here. In Czech already, it's, it's different. In Germany, it will be different. In France, it will be different. So, so far, I know that lots of people say when they read it that they cry, which was not our intention, I think, at all. It's more like that people would think. And I'm just very curious what they can learn from it in different countries. Uh, I myself didn't think about until the book was finished how similar it is to the refugees of today, really, which I should have. How 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 difficult it is, like for what one of my friends said, to take a child and put it on the train and for his better future as, as a parent or something, you say, go, go, and you never see the child again. So there are lots of things I think about myself every day. Yeah, yeah, that kind of goes back to Sharon's question about um, <clears throat> what the book means to us personally. Right. Right. I find that it has given me a, you know, kind of a fresh view of some of those contemporary experiences. Um, you know, I, one of the people that you didn't mention, I don't think, as one of Winton's children is um, Alf Dobbs in the UK, who is, yeah. as a, a member of the British Parliament, has legislated for, um, for, refugee children in Europe. Um, and I think for, um, for librarians, for teachers, for parents in the US, this book has something to say about the experience of migrant children coming to this country. So um, um, we are one minute away, I think, from time. Um, I'm going to share a couple of comments, if I may, from the uh, um, this is from uh, Shanaz, who says, I wanted to share what a, oh, my column, She's my box just disappeared. Uh, well, wanted, okay. <laughs> wanted to share what a privilege it is to listen to Peter. Um, when I moved to New York, I noticed the posters in the subway um, and learned about your work. <clears throat> um, she says, uh, I brought this book for my 16 year old. Can't wait to read it. Thank you for bringing hope to the world. Um, there's also a nice, uh, mention here of Francis Foster, who we both oh, knew. Yes. Um, and uh, I often channel Francis when I'm, who is a wonderful um, editor who worked with Peter for many, many years. Um, I often channel Francis when I'm thinking about your work. So it's nice to think of her here. Um, so I think we are close to time. Um, thank you to po Politics and Prose and thank you, Peter, for spending the afternoon. Um, and thank I you very much. Thank you, both of you. That was wonderful. Thank you for that 
wonderful discussion and thank you for talking about your personal connections to the story. Um, also to our audience, thank you for your wonderful questions and your comments. We always pre appreciate the, the kindness and Simon and Peter, you are really wonderful about just you know talking about your connections to this and talking about how important people like this are in our society. So thank you all for that. Just a reminder as we're wrapping up here that you can still get a copy of the book. In the chat there, there's a link to the website where you can get that. You can also follow us in social media. We'd love to have you join us for future events. And we're just so pleased to have been able to do this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. You're such a pleasure to be here. Thank you.